Island uh, that were put there by uh, passing ships to deliberately in order to uh, uh, eat food for passing ships. Um, he converts this into a much more controlled cattle breeding operation and eventually has about 20,000 head of cattle. Um, and he's producing lots of fruits and vegetables fairly quickly, largely to sell to the passing ship trade. And then he moves into sugar and coffee as commodity crops that can make him a lot of cash. So this is his house. And it's actually, I'm not going go into great details about these things, but um, if you look at the average uh, wealthy hacienda owner's house in, on the Ecuadorian coast in this kind of time period, you'd see something a heck of a lot prettier than that. Um, I mean, it's kind of large, I guess. But there's no architectural grace to it whatsoever. There's a lot of kind of confusion and debate about, is he a psychopath? Is he attempting to found his own country? Is he far nicer than he's given credit for? Is this all a bit of a trumped up sort of a situation? So there's a lot of sort of moral and ethical things involved, both with the modern community's vision of their own past, because the descendants of these peasants who op operated this place are still there, uh, and then the role of people in the Galapagos and what Cobos's image is. Um, this is the worker housing. These, all of these are 1888. These are all from the... Um, Albatross, the, the U.S. Fish Commission um, expedition, and they stopped and visited him and had a, a very nice camera with them, apparently. Um, this is the uh, distribution of rations. Uh, those are, one assumes, uh, workers' wives as such, female heads of families, coming to a centralized kitchen to pick up a daily ration that's cooked in these big vats. Uh, and uh, the steam um, sugar processing equipment, which this is actually a 1905 photo, and I don't think it's operational by this point. I think it's broken down. So our project overall, the larger uh, scale um, goals of it, have more to do with ideas about human impacts on the island environment, uh, the relationship of all this to uh, how agriculture works on the edge of a national park, uh, how humans have altered these islands in the last hundred years because generally when we look at the Galapagos, people see it as wilderness, except for the islands like Chatham that are called something like irrelevant because they've been changed so much by humans that obviously they're not wilderness anymore. And we're kind of interested in that transition of this isn't wilderness, how do we define wilderness? How do these agriculturalists live beside this national park? You're probably all aware that you know, there, there's been a long history of national parks pushing people out that has now changed into an idea of maybe it's not such a great idea for national parks to push people out. And so there's a lot of kind of general things going on there. Um, but for myself and as archaeologists, um, what we did over the last couple of years was to survey the village, which was the Hacienda village uh, and is still a village with people living in it, um, test pit a, a bunch of places, and the main thing that we found that was of the greatest interest was um, quite a thick um, midden from, now I want to say from Kobos's house, but I actually think it's probably from the entire operation, because I think the uh, trash material is coming both from his house and also from that kitchen complex, which is right beside his house, and so I think what you're seeing in the midden are remains both of his things and of things that workers probably um, contributed in some senses, or at least the rations of the workers would have contributed to this trash. And uh, um, I was thinking that I could explain endlessly what the place looks like, but we do have a bunch of videos online, so I thought we could play one. Um, this one has no dialogue. If you want me to be further embarrassed, you could go online and look at a bunch of other ones where I actually speak fractured Spanish and uh, things like that. But um, if we can... Oh, yeah, am I going to be able to do this? Let's see if we can make it work. Um, my intention being that it's a better visual um, idea overall of what the place looks like. And I'll give you some dialogue as we go through this. Um, for the locals, uh, 
Vinea Films is Fernando's brother's production company. So yeah, the first part's irrelevant apart from being pretty in the sense that um, what was going on was the local divers were interested in the fact that Kobos' pier is in the middle of the um, harbor there and they really wanted to go pick stuff up. So Fernando was really into it, so he demanded that we go down with them and, and uh, pull things off the bottom. And I was surprised how little was actually on the bottom of the harbor. Um, apparently they clean it up every year. And so I think anything historic, they've probably chucked in the trash long ago. It's a horrible place to work. Um, so this is the port, Bacariso Moreno, uh, where Cobos would have had his um, ship parked, but the hacienda operations in the center of the island about mm, six kilometers inland. So this is the village where the uh, hacienda operation is. The house is a 1940s replacement for Cobos's house, but his house was in this same location. And they've got a bit of historical commemoration in terms of having some pathways and signage and things like that. It's certainly recognized as, what, the most important historic thing that ever happened on the island, which amounts to five or six tourists a week coming up and staring at a half broken down house. So there's definitely a sense of working with the community largely with the idea of tourism in mind. And Galapagos is definitely interested in changing from just going there for wilderness and traveling on ships to actually interacting with locals and seeing other things like heritage. Fernando bakes plants and Peter measures bones. Um, this is all Galapagos Science Center, which is down on the coast, which is a great facility in terms of having given us uh, lab space in a really nice environment to be able to work on things, and they have a lot of lab equipment, etc. So yeah, an awful lot of what we were excavating was alcohol bottles. And Kobos was famous in terms of what visitors described, elite visitors like people from scientific expeditions and uh, government officials, for parties and, and giving you lots of drinks and then things getting completely out of control and inappropriate. Um, and I think that's kind of important to the whole power structure of how this is, uh, uh, how what Kobo saw as his role. So the period that we're talking about is around 1870 to 1914. Um, in Europe, we might call it the Belle Epoque. In, in the United States, we might call it the Gilded Age. and Latin America at that time was experiencing a massive increase in their export economies. Um, it was a boom time in places like the city of Guayaquil in terms of steam navigation becoming really important to making much faster connections around the world, um, trade liberalization with the end of colonialism and then movements into, you sort of have this 50 year period of chaos after uh, colonialism and and by the 1870s, a nation like Ecuador is getting fairly organized in terms of wage labor and debt peonage, plantation agriculture in commodities that are wanted all around the globe. Um, so yeah, if we look at the sort of general idea of the, most of the material culture that we excavated from Cobos's hacienda, it is a vast collection of European ceramics from France and Belgium, which were not coming into Ecuador before these kinds of dates and a vast collection of wine and ale and liquor bottles, um, uh, including things like um, uh, French rum, which is very odd when you make rum on your plantation, but of course you refuse to drink it. You must have rum from France, which is being actually exported from the Caribbean to France, bottled, and then returned to you in Ecuador. So, the coins. Um, David Graeber, in his book Debt, uh, gives us kind of a Marxist analysis of the uh, overall idea of money. And it's, uh, I hadn't really thought about this much before digging up some vulcanite coins. In Renaissance Europe, gold and silver were standard kinds of coinage, And you call that a bimetallic standard in terms of 
um, the weight of the gold that's in the coin is the value of the coin. Yeah? Um, there's, in Renaissance Europe, as kind of a starting point, lots of silver in circulation among, among people like banks and merchants and nobles. Graeber's point is that the poor don't have access to this kind of thing in terms of how do the poor in Renaissance Europe exchange things. A lot of them do it in ways that we as anthropologists would be very familiar with in terms of I kind of sort of owe you something, but I'm your cousin's brother's uncle, so obviously we owe each other things, and then next year we're all going to get together and do this, right? And you're like, well, what's the exact value of that? It's like it has no value. It's a relationship. I know you, you know me, you know I'm good for it. These kinds of things, yeah? Beyond that, you then move into some fairly um, uh, simple, but, but in, some, in some senses revolutionary ideas of we could write all this down, yeah? So we could write down a particular value and say, you owe me this, and then we won't forget, which standardizes things a lot, yeah? But I think what, what's important here is there are two systems. There's a money system for the wealthy and a complete lack of money system for the poor. Is, is Graeber's point. The thing is, that's fine. You can survive on your brother's cousin's agricultural crops and, and helping him out with his sheep or whatever, except if landlords, governments, and merchants demand that you pay them in cash. Yeah? And then you're in a bit of trouble in terms of what are we going to do to make cash? Maybe we're going to have to leave home. Maybe our land is going to get taken away from us. And this is Graeber's short history of Western civilization in the form of coinage. Yeah? And so he sees coinage as important in terms of controlling and figuring out ideas about not just debt, but also ideas about who's a vagrant, who's valid to be a military conscript, all of these kinds of things. Yeah? You get yourself into debt, and then you're in trouble. Um, there's... Beyond a Marxist interpretation of, of people having trouble with money, there's a simple economic thing of bimetallic standards being, to a modern economist, not the greatest way of trying to run your economy. Uh, and this is something that, as we get into the 19th century, people who are seriously involved in large-scale trade realize that this doesn't work so well. And so one thing that happens is we move towards a gold standard rather than a bimetallic standard. Reason being, um, you don't want to have transaction costs for people constantly trading in things. And a bimetallic standard has a bizarre thing of, if you have silver and the value of silver changes, the raw metal, then it could be worth more than the face value on the coins, at which point you'd melt the coins yeah, and sell the silver off, at which point you wouldn't have any more silver coins to be trading in. At the same time, the value of gold might be going up or down, and it's all too complicated. Yeah? At the same time, of course, underneath that, all the small transactions are being done in all kinds of ways, and what comes in after the 17th century tokens towns and merchants and pubs and all that saying, well, I don't trust you. I don't know you personally, but you can buy something from me. I need a medium for you to buy a simple pint of ale. And uh, how are we going to do that? So I'll issue tokens, and then you can use them in my shop or my town issues tokens. They're making small change, but they're making it at local levels all over the place. Um, so yeah, if you hold gold or silver coins, you could buy and sell and speculate in them. Um, above face value gives you problems. There's also, of course, a temptation in this. The easiest way to use token value things is to just get foreign coins. So you could start hauling coins from other countries across the border into your country and use those as legal tender or uh, um, uh, tokens that are only valuable for particular things, right? Co th these all have transaction costs. And economically, we'd like to smooth all that over by having a standardized, a more standardized value. But it's surprising, I think, oh, yeah, so... Um, there, there's a name, I love this, right? Um, if we study these uh, uh, tokens that are not official national currency, it's exonumismatics if you're, help me out, Mark, it's exonumismatics if you're American and paranumismatics if you're British, I think, or the other way around. Uh, anyway, one of these is the American term and one of these is the, but I just love the name um, in terms of studying these. They are certainly not restricted any particular area of the earth. It's something that happened all over the world. 
Um, and of course, we think, well, we don't do this nowadays. Um, this is a Chuck E. Cheese's super token. Um, it's good for every time you buy a pizza and a pitcher of Coke, the name actually done in the proper lettering, for the next year, you will get five free tokens. Um, so yes, we still use tokens of great. Go to the airport, right? They've got tokens with RFIDs in them now. That's kind of a mind-bending. They're not even worth a particular value. They're worth a value that's electrically, yeah, OK. Um, but yes, it's something that's been common for a long time all over the place. But it's also seen as a bit of an economic problem if it, if it takes too much uh, um, emphasis in the economy. Um, so yeah, we'd call them probably trade tokens. Script is usually for paper money. Yeah, that's what people would call it. Um, in Latin America, features de feature is a token, right? Uh, a feature de hacienda is a, is a token created by a hacienda or a finca, an agricultural thing. There's features of all kinds of things, yeah, merchants and uh, uh, pubs and whatever. And then my favorite is tlacos. That's the Nahuatl term for a half or chunk or bit. And so in Mexico, they actually use the um, Nahuatl Aztec word to de in the 19th century to describe what these are on haciendas. Oh my goodness. Point of the overwhelming amount of text, in the 1850s, economists and government officials in North America and a little earlier in Europe decided it was worth fixing this. And so they started to do particular things. They fix on a gold standard as some kind of shining thing at the top. And then they begin to produce increasing amounts of small change, quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies, these kinds of things. And those are token values in the sense that the government says it's worth 25 cents. If you melt it down, it's not worth 25 cents. It can be made out of anything. If you take it to another country, then they can decide what value that has in exchange for theirs. You can control how much of it, if you are the only mint producing it, is in the market. And so you then gain more control over how much money is circulating. There's all kinds of wonderfully modern things that happen. right? And I think this is about modernity, a lot, a lot of this. Um, the other thing that happens with this that's quite interesting is we think of things as being instantaneous. But of course, transport is a problem in the 1820s or 50s or 70s. And there's a lot of discussion that national coinage is easy to do in cities. But once you get out in the hinterland, there's um, no coins available. And thus, the government should put out more coins. It's like, well, no, well, we don't want to flood the city. And it's like, well, then you need to move them around and things like this, which becomes very relevant if you're on the Galapagos Islands. Yeah. Um, so we could call the period from 1850 to 1930 a period of uh, uh, change towards change. Um, having small denomination currency that is at a national level. Um, there's also a lot of interesting discussion in terms of this isn't just about economics. This is about bringing people into the nation. And the people who make the coins and make decisions about making the coins say, we should put this kind of symbol on it because people are going to carry these around in their pockets and realize that they are Canadian because they have a thing that says Canada in their pocket. And the... Uh, People in both Canada and the United States, and I would assume in most countries who are in charge of this kind of thing, discuss that at great length as being something that's going to bring national unity, having a single currency that goes all the way down through the different value levels of what uh, currency is available. In Ecuador and in a lot of Latin America, the process is later in the sense that you have independence from Spain in the 1820s, a lot of different kinds of foreign currencies and tokens circulating in the country. Um, after 1860s, we, we have increasingly liberal economic policies in Ecuador in terms of encouraging free trade, encouraging free movement across borders, and a, and a, and a, a push towards having this kind of currency. But the thing is, an awful lot of people in the country are under a system where um, they are debt peons running under a system that they would call um, uh, libros de raya or tiendas de raya. These are ledger books, account books, where the simplest thing to do is to have a list of names and simple ticks, which are the rayas in the book beside your name, saying how much you owe or how much you've earned. You don't need fancy coinage to keep track of this. And in Ecuador, they go for quite a while um, using account books as the main way that this operates. 
But in 1872, they begin to issue things like small copper coinage, token coinage, if you like, um, at a national scale. Um, 1890, they do a larger scale issue, and they make their first attempt to ban the use of tokens entirely. So you can't produce your own money, it's illegal. Um, of course, if you're paying attention, Kobos is doing that in this time period, yeah? Um, so his 1904 murder comes right in the middle of this liberal shift towards uh, small denomination change. He was producing his own money. Um, we know that. Uh, and we know that uh, only, I think, because um, he was killed by his workmen. This caused a commission of inquiry into what was going on on those islands. And the commission of inquiry sent people out who then published a book which includes these, uh, a, a set of illustrations of what he was producing. So he was producing scripts, small paper bills. He was producing copper stuff that looks quite ugly, and I suspect by its ugliness was produced on the island itself. Um, he initially was producing these little lead ones that are incredibly uh, rough looking. And then he also has um, uh, a couple of types of coinage that are not produced on the island. He's contracted those to be produced by a uh, an industrial producer somewhere else. So we dig and we find coins. We found 11,435 artifacts, uh, and of those, eight of them were either tokens or bits of tokens. Yeah, and of those eight bits, you've got one of the lead um, things that people say are were worth five cents in the in the uh, testimony of the of the workers. Um, I think these are a bit earlier. This is his initial attempt to have some form of small currency. Uh, and then five of these black um, vulcanite Anacarsis Medina Chandui five centavo coins. Uh, two fragments of Anacarsis 20 centavo coins. Heck is Anacarsis Medina? Wow. I puzzled. I was like, wow, that's an exotic sounding. It's, it, I guess Anacarsis is a fairly common men's first name in the 19th century in Ecuador, not one that you hear at all now. Um, Anacarsis Medina was a merchant in the town of Chandui, where Cobos was from. So far in all of our research, we have found no mention that Anacarsis uh, Medina was in any way involved in this plantation. I'm assuming what happened was uh, Medina probably has his own shop on the mainland, is producing these coins, and so um, Cobos simply buys buckets, barrels, or whatever of these coins to hold them out there and use as his currency. Um, and of course, you know, we have this sort of historical idea of what the money was like to compare to an archaeological idea of what the money was like. And it's quite clear from our archaeological sample that the Medina stuff is the most common stuff that was being used. And so this idea that he's me megalomaniacally wanting to print his own money so he can see his name for his own country or something like that is in some senses clearly ridiculous, yeah? He's, he's clearly looking for uh, whatever the cheapest solution to having cash is. So, yeah, they're made of vulcanite. They're, they're hard rubber. Um, and that also was fascinating in the sense that uh, the ones in Guatemala aren't, and the ones in Costa Rica aren't, and the ones in the Caribbean largely aren't, but the ones on the north coast of Chile are, and a fair number from places like Sumatra are, and you begin to realize that vulcanite coins seem like they're a Pacific thing. And uh, hmm, they must be really cheap to make, I would assume, even compared to, say, copper. And uh, they're also incredibly lightweight, obviously, for shipping around. Now, I don't know how important that was. Um, and yeah, there's no co we have no national coinage from the Hacienda in his time period. We have no copper tokens or any other form of tokens. They say he's making paper and leather and things like that, which obviously didn't survive. So we have these really sad leather ones followed by these vulcanite ones. Um, I came across a, uh, uh, Guatemala has some, and they said that they got their vulcanite from Moise and Klinkner in San Francisco. And then I actually found a reference in Chile that says that they were buying vulcanite coins from Moise and Klinkner in San Francisco. I'm wondering if all the vulcanite tokens in the Pacific are from one single manufacturer. I don't know that, but it is the only manufacturer I've heard reference from. Now, it's actually two manufacturers in the sense there was a Moise company and there was a Klinkner company and then they eventually came together, but it's all 
related. And were they the main providers of Vulcanite coins to the world? It's an interesting way around what is an Eastern North American and British dominated manufacturing market. So if you wanted nice silver or copper or things like that, coins in Ecuador, you would send to England for them, usually to Heaton's of Birmingham. Yeah? And so the Vulcanite is maybe a cheap and quick way of getting around the expense of doing that. Um, so we have this megalomaniac who wants to have his own money so that the workers can't spend it anywhere except at his store. This is a standard story about a hacienda owner who, who is evil because he uses this money to keep people on the plantation and they're never getting off. Um, and then we say, well, yeah, but what are they supposed to use for spare change? If this was a pub in London or a uh, merchant store in Colorado that was using tokens, you wouldn't be making up a silly story about a megalomaniac who you'd be saying, well, people just don't have enough change. So obviously they make their own change. I don't understand why you think that has anything to do with oppressing anyone. That's ridiculous. And so I think at some level, we don't dig up oppression by digging up a bunch of Vulcanite coins. Now, was he a nasty person? Well, in the court testimony of why they murdered him, they said that over the time that uh, they had been working for him, he had shot five workers, he killed 10 of them by whipping them to death, and then 15 others he'd put on different islands with no water to see how they'd do, and then didn't come back. Um, so I don't think that there's much question that he wasn't that nice a person, but I'm not sure how much that has to do with running a hacienda under debt peonage. Now we could say, well, these workers were never going to make enough money to save up money so that they could buy a middle class house and have a 401k. And I think what Graeber would say to you is, yes, that's how capitalism works. Get over yourselves. Go to China and see who's making your iPhones. Go to Vietnam and see who's making your clothing. They don't have 401ks. Um, but yeah, an interesting point in terms of how the incident killing him and the court case over um, uh, whether they should be uh, prosecuted for killing him brings up all these ideas about morality and whether he was a moral person or not. And they use the money as one of the ways of talking about whether he was a moral person. Um, so a news reporter, 190405, goes over after his death, um, describes the money circulating. He says that they had coins of 5 and 20 centavos, bills of 50 centavos, 1 sucre and 5 sucre. It's just kind of a boringly um, uh, uh, um, stated thing. There is no mention in the newspaper that the use of these coins somehow contributed to was running something nefarious. Um, the investigative commission recorded testimony from an elderly peon who says that they used to make five centavo coins from lead and they switched to leather uh, and that um, the commission asked, can you show us what this money looked like? And they said, no, we don't have any anymore. Uh, and at that time in 1904, they were being paid in rubber tokens, copper coins, or small bills, all issued by the Hacienda. Um, and never, the worker says, in, or I believe the commission director says, in good national coinage or banknotes issued by a real bank. This is the commission putting on the thing. This is not a worker's complaint. It's the commission putting on Kobos the idea that he should be paying people in national coinage because that's the idea of what Ecuador is supposed to be becoming as a modern nation. He's not acting in a modern way. Um, the first act of the killers after killing him was to burn all the ledger books. It was the first, they had to break into a locked room to pull out all the ledger books, put them in a bonfire, and burn them all. And it's one of the things that everyone who testified what happened agreed they did. And so it's clear that debt is what they're pissed off about, partly. And the debt is being recorded in the ledger books. It has very little to do with the little coins. Yeah. Um, if you like, ironically, uh, they went to Guayaquil, had this big uh, um, uh, court case, were um, uh, let off because they said, no, actually, we think he probably was evil, and it was probably OK that you killed him. And so they left them to be homeless on the streets of Guayaquil. So these workers are then entirely without the means to even feed themselves. 
Uh, and so then they actually set up a charity in Guayaquil to uh, um, collect money to uh, feed these workers who have done this deed. So if we want to take a Marxist standpoint and follow many Latin American popular historians, we could characterize Hacienda tokens as a technology of oppression. Yeah? Uh, Kobos keeps his workers in debt peonage by only paying them in silly plastic coins that you can't spend anywhere else. Economists would say otherwise. They'd say that he was attempting to be modern and not just use uh, uh, ledger books anymore, but also uh, being a late 19th century capitalist who knew how modernity was moving, he wanted to be able to give his workers a system where they could pay standardized values for things. That's what people do in the modern world, even for small transactions like buying bread or beer or whatever. Yeah? Um, he was clearly evil. He sexually assaulted people. He whipped them. He killed workers. Um, but... He could have kept track of debts with simple bookkeeping, and he decided instead to spend money on modernizing his coin system. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean, the workers burned the ledgers. They complained that they weren't paid in national coinage uh, uh, to the commission, but I really don't think that's what's the important part of this. So yeah, Peter Stahl and Florencio are. Uh, um, uh, my partners uh, on this uh, shirt project uh, from UVic and from USFQ. Uh, Fernando, my PhD student, was um, heavily involved in this from the beginning, has now uh, just returned to Ecuador to finish writing his dissertation. You can all write to him and say, keep writing, Fernando. Uh, and John Welch loaned me Graeber's debt 